There were at least five Qurans in seventh, from the seventh century from Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. We cannot find one of them. But you've been told there's only one Quran. And the one that was chosen by Saudi Arabia was the Hafs. Guess how many differences there are between Hafs and the other 29? 93,000. Until the 10th century, there were 700 different Qurans. Yasser Qadi says, we do not talk about this in public. This is the most difficult problem for Muslim scholars for the last thousand years. Yasser Qadi, after 28 minutes, finally had to give in. And he finally had to admit, they're all the Quran. All 30 of them. You take a little bit of Kaloon, you take a little bit of Warsh, you take a little bit of Hafs, and you just mix them out, and that's the Quran we have today. Has the Quran been changed? Every Muslim will go, no. Is the Quran the final revelation of Allah? Every Muslim would go, yes. Now, this video you're about to watch is or would be one of the hardest hit to the quran you are ever going to see on the internet the problem here is every muslim would believe the quran is the final with the hadith being the commentary to the quran right some would say no some would say yes because they do not agree or disagree with the text or some of the text in the hadith but i'm taking it from zakanaik zakanaik and other muslim apologists say the hadith is the commentary to the Quran. The Quran by itself is a complete book. Alhamdulillah by itself. But if you want commentary in more details about it, then you refer to the sayings, the authentic sayings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi which we call as Sayy Hadith. And so if you want to study vividly or get deeply into the life of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, study the Hadith. Now, if you decide to dissect the Quran and the Hadith, there are so many narratives you would encounter that you might want clarification to. And so this might lead you to a Muslim sheikh or an imam or something for answers. And the best answer you are going to get is you have to study the Arabic. Now, before I continue, I would like us to watch this video and then make my assessment Let's get into the video for today. What do the Muslims claim about the Quran? Number one, it's uncreated. It's right there in the Quran itself in chapter 85, verse 22. Therefore, it has not, never, um, it has never been had any chance that any human could have any control over it. It was sent down to Muhammad okay, between 610 and 632. That's what they claim. It was completed by Uthman in 652. That's why this book in this hand, my hand right here is from Uthman, they say. And then number four, the Quran is unchanged in the last 1400 years. Not one word, not one letter has changed. Have you heard Muslims say this? Every Muslim says those four things. Just memorize those four words. Uncreated, sent down, completed, unchanged. That's all you need to know. I'll come back to it. I'm going to shut down those four, but I'm going to show you something even better about those four. Hold on. So what do Christians claim about the Bible? Is the Bible uncreated? No, of course it's created. We know who wrote it. We even know the authors. We put their names on most of the books. The Bible is not sent down. It was inspired by God, but not sent down uh, by, uh, through an angel. The Bible was complete, so yes, we would say that that uh, was the case, the thing is, we don't have any of the original manuscripts, so we don't know what the complete is. Has it been changed? Yeah, parts of it has. We know where they've been changed. We know even what we even put, we're very transparent. We put and write where the, the verses that have been added or, or there have been scribal errors have been taken away. So we know that. We're very clear about that. And we're only talking about 40 verses out of over 6,000 verses. So tonight, I'm not going to shut down uncreated or sent down because I'm not there. I'm going to shut down complete and unchanged, those two. That's what I want to look at. So what I want to look for is one Quran manuscript from the 7th century that's complete, 114 surahs, that is unchanged. And this is what I've asked Muslims all over the world. I've debated uh, over 100 uh, debates that I've done with Muslims, and this is what I always ask. Show me one manuscript of your Quran from the 7th century that's unchanged, just like the Quran I have in my hand here. Where do we go to find out about the Quran? We have to go to Sahih Bukhari. Remember I told him that he died in 870, so we, he's the one that tells us how the Quran was put together. Now this is what he says. He says, Muhammad died in 632, it had not been written down. It finally got written down in its final form uh, at the time of Uthman in 652, the third caliph. He then sent five copies to five different cities, Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. And those then became the, canon, the canonized Quran for the whole world. 
uh, in 652. The problem is almost immediately another Quran supplants the one in Damascus by, written by Uba ibn Qab. It had 116 surahs. That's two more than are in the Quran today. Another was written in Baghdad, written by Ibn Masud. It had 110 surahs. That's, that's a four less than what is in the Quran today. Another was written by Ibn Musa, 114 surahs. It had so many differences. According to, according to Arthur Jeffrey, who's done the work on this, if you just look at those manuscripts and you compare with the Quran today, there are about 15,000 differences. You've got a problem. So how could there have been one Quran? There were at least five Qurans in seventh, from the seventh century from Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. We cannot find one of them. Now, one of those Qurans exists today. Folks, we're only talking about 1,400 years ago. As Christians, we have the Sidiaticus, the Galax and Drinus. We have the Vaticanus. These are from the third and fourth century. That's two to 300 years before the Quran. Why can we reproduce our entire Bible? We have 365 manuscripts of the New Testament before the seventh century. Why can't they come up with one Quran from the seventh century? That's my question. They are the ones that claim it, not me. Where are these five manuscripts? Look at those cities. They've always been controlled by Islam for the last 1400 years. So how could they have lost it? Rather inept, wouldn't you say? So, we, before we get into the manuscripts, I want to look at the Kirat. These are the readings. This has probably done the most devastating material that's just come out in the last few years. These are the original manuscripts. Now, I say original means these are the earliest manuscripts. You notice when you read them, you can all read the Arabic. You notice you can't. Why can't you read that? Because in order to be an Ara reader Arabic, you need to have dots and vowels, right? There are no dots and vowels on that. You need that. Why? Because those manuscripts, the Samarkand and the Sana, those ones had 16 letters, but you can't read it today unless you have vowels to help you out or dots. Today there are 28 letters, so obviously another 12 letters were added. Why? Because of the dots. Now there are six letters that don't require dots, like the alif, the kaf, the lam, the mim, the nu, ha, and the wow. The other 22 all require dots. What am I talking about? Well, take a look at one smiley face. One smiley face is usually the root of most letters in Arabic. If you put one dot above, you have a na. Two dots above, you have a ta. Three dots above, you have a tha. One dot below, you have a ba. Two dots below, you have a ya. Na, ta, tha, ba, ya. Five dots were added in the 8th century. Not in the 7th century. Now I can read it. But that didn't exist in the 7th century. Not in those manuscripts you just saw. Hold on, what about dialectical differences. You need to have three vowels to have dialectical differences. So you need to be, have a dama, uh, which is the u sound. You need to have a kasra, which is the e sound. And you need to have a fatta, which is the a uh sound. Those were only added in the late 8th century and the early 9th century. So you've got a problem here. Because suddenly you have Abdul Malik who comes to power and he wants to create a Quran because he's now introducing a prophet. A prophet has to have a book. So what do you do? You have to borrow right, left, and center. But the problem is you're borrowing in Arabic and you don't have any Arabic that has dots and vowels. So you decide to write your Quran with your dots in it and you call it Hafs. You decide to write your, well, you're supposed to be a male, but let's say pretend you're male today, and you call it Warsh. And you decide to write your Quran and you put your dots and vowels wherever you want to. You live in Kufa, you live in Cairo, you live in Damascus, and you put your own dots wherever you want to, and you put your dots where you want to. Suddenly we have four different Qurans, right? In four different cities. Well, that starts to proliferate. Until the 10th century, there were 700 different Qurans. Did you hear me? 700 different Qurans. According to this man who did his doctoral thesis, he's now head of uh, the Islamic department at Harvard University. Shadi Nasser, he guessed the nest base because they're not there today. Now, you've got a problem. I've got all these Qurans, none of them are agreeing. You've got a difficulty. So Ibn Mujahid, man in the 10th century, was given the responsibility to choose seven. But before we do that, notice, if dots are in different places with different vowels, just with three different one of those little smiley faces, you get 19 different words. There's the difficulty. So here's what he did. He was given the responsibility to choose seven, and these are the first seven he chose. Nafi from Medina, Ibn Kathir from Mecca, Abu Amr from Basra, Ab Ibn Amir from Damascus, Asim from Kufa, Hafsa from Kufa, and al iskasai from Kufa. Notice, not, notice that three of them are from Kufa, one to Damascus, uh, the other one is, is, is from Basra, and the other two are from Arabia. <laughs> Look at the dates. What do you notice about the dates of every one of those? Look at the death dates. Every one of them either died between 736 and 805. That means 8th and 9th century. Did any of these men know Muhammad? Did they even live in the same century as Muhammad? So how could they have come from Muhammad? 
these are the seven that every Muslim will swear came from Muhammad. But no one's daughter to look at their dates. I am the one that put the dates up there. You've got to put the dates together, folks. And this is where you're going to shut down every Muslim. They have no idea of these dates. Those are the first seven. But this book is not there. This is Hafs. This is the official book for the whole world today. Memorized by 93% of all Muslims. Hafs an Asim. Do you see Asim's name up there, number five? He is a disciple of Asim. So in 1194, two disciples were chosen from every one of the seven to make 14, right? And that was chosen by al Shatabi in 1194. Now you have seven plus 14. How many do you have? 21. Am I correct? I hope my math's right. That still isn't good enough. In the 15th century, in 429, another man named Al-Jazari chose another nine to culminate with another 21. So now you have 30 different Qurans. No two are alike. But you've been told there's only one Quran. Right? And the one that was chosen by Saudi Arabia was the Hafs that you see there. Guess how many differences there are between Hafs and the other 29? 93,000. 93,000. This is the first time you're hearing this, right? I hope you people who are watching, you Muslims who are watching, you're listening to this. This is going to shut down your Quran for you. Who is the one that found this? Hatun Tosh, my colleague. She's only five foot two. She's from Turkey. In London, she and I were on the ladder for three years there at Speaker's Corner every Sunday. She was the one that found these by accident because she went to Morocco. She went to Yemen. She went to Jordan. And she went into a bookstore and says, show me a Quran. And they said, well, which Quran are you talking about? She said, what do you mean, which Quran? They said, well, we have Kalun here. We have Hafs over here. We have Warsh over here. We have Kisai over here. We have Ibn Kathir. She said, well, give them all to me. So she brought them back to London, showed me them. And I looked at them and I said, oh, man, I started laughing. I thought these were all destroyed in 1924. They're in Cairo and thrown into the Nile. Evidently not. There they are. She has found now 26 of them. She brought 26 of them down to Speaker's Corner. We held them up in 2016. We filmed it and went all over the internet. This shut down the Quran in 2016. See the man that's there on the right, the tall man with the beard? His name is Muhammad Hijab. One of the most popular men on the internet. He has a following about anywhere from half a million to a million followers. He was there filming us when he was doing that. He realized there was a problem. He quickly went outside the crowd and he yelled at all the people, come to me, do not look at what they're showing you. Do not listen to what they're saying. I will explain everything to you. Obviously he explained it pretty well, why? Because four years later, he was shown these material. I'm not gonna go into all of these. You can go into every one of them, but you can see the huffs on the left, the waters on the right. In every case, it's completely different words. Just by changing the vowels, by changing the docs, you not only get different words, you get different meanings. You don't even get different meanings. You get different doctrines, you get different theologies, and you get different practices. It shuts down the Quran from being preserved. Obviously, these are all done by man. There's a problem there. And so he came to this man who's the leading authority there on the right, Yasser Qadi, there in Houston, and he said, I have a problem. I'm going to put my hand out here, and I'm going to, this is a blank piece of paper. Which Quran are you going to write on it? Which is the one that's eternal? Which is the one that was revealed to Muhammad? Tell me, which one of it? Remember, he was the one that told all the Muslims. He was going to explain it to them. Yasser Qadi says, we do not talk about this in public. This is the most difficult problem for Muslim scholars for the last thousand years. He said, we have a respect for the Quran. We, there are certain questions we don't ask. So Muhammad said, was that the problem you had when you were at Yale University getting your doctorate on this in 1995? Is that where you had a crisis of faith? He said, no, 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 not crisis of faith, crisis of knowledge. Notice the difference. He said, in the West, the scholars have come leaps and bounds in the last hundred years. And they're looking at you, pointing to Muhammad Hijab in the East, they're looking at you like the emperor with no clothes. Why? Because your standard narrative has holes in it. What narrative? Standard Islamic narrative. S-I-N. Has holes in it. Well, we know sin has holes in it. But can you see what happened? This was only a 28 long... This is really a question that was happening. It was an interview for 28 minutes. He didn't know we were all watching this. He said... I never have talked about this for 25 years. I will never do a lecture on this. So Muhammad Hijam put his hand out a second time. He said, you've got to tell me which is the one that's eternal. Because the Quran says in chapter 85, 22, 1 and 22, that this book is eternal. The Quran says in chapter 10, verse 15, in chapter 18, verse 27, that no man can change one word or even one letter. It says in the Quran, chapter 15, verse 9, that Allah protects his word. Which is the one? 
Yasser Qadi, after 28 minutes, finally had to give in. And he finally had to admit, they're all the Quran. All 30 of them. You take a little bit of Kaloon, you take a little bit of Warsh, you take a little bit of Hafs, and you just mix them out, and that's the Quran we have today. I started clapping. I was watching this live. I said, Yasser Qadi, you have no idea. You've just now admitted that there are 93,000 differences. I'm going to show you these two right here. These are two of them right here. There's the Hafs. Here's the Warsh. You can buy these on the internet. This is the one that is memorized by 93% of the world's population. This is memorized by 3% of the world's population. This is from Egypt. This one is from Kufa in Iraq. There are 5,000 different words between these two books. I'm holding them right here. This shuts down the Quran. Within two weeks, if you looked at their sites, there were hundreds of Muslims. They said, we're leaving Islam because of what you have said. And our blood is going to be on your shoulders. They had to shut down those comments. Within two months, they had to take that video off of both their sites, but I've got it. David Wood has it. Hatun Tosh has it. And every June 8th of every year, we bring up that interview once over again and show the whole world. You cannot say that this comes from God. You cannot even say it comes from Muhammad. You can't even say it comes from Muthman. This has been changed and manipulated from the last 1,400 years. Now let's get to the manuscripts, because the manuscripts we do have. Now, we have 8,500 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin Vulgates, another 9,000 in 11 different languages. That's roughly 24,000 to 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament alone. Am I correct? Just say yes. How many manuscripts do they have that are early? Six. You want to see them? There they are, the top copy from East, uh, Turkey, the Samarkand from Uzbekistan, the Ma'il in London, the Petropolitanus, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way, from France, the Aluzani there in Cairo, and the Sana manuscript, the most exciting, there in Yemen. I'm not going to unpack every one of them. These are the ones we're debating. I did a debate on these four, six manuscripts in 2014 with the world's leading scholar, Dr. Shabir Ali. He could not answer one question because he never looked at these manuscripts. I have three of them, the facsimiles of three of them in my office. We're looking at them. Folks, do you notice what we have found? No two of these manuscripts are from the 7th century. They're from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. No two are alike. And they don't agree with the Quran we have today. The best one, the top copy, which is about 99%, has 2,270 manuscript variants. When you look at the Sanaa manuscript, it has two different layers of letters, and there are 63 verses in the lower layer. It has 70 variants just within those 63 verses. Can you see there's a problem here? I'm not going to get into these ones here. These are the carbon datings. But when you look at the carbon datings of the earliest manuscript, the Sana manuscript, they, the datings of the carbon datings of this manuscript, they are date from 390 to 550. They all predate the Quran. They predate Islam and they predate Muhammad, proving that carbon dating don't use. So they came up with this book here called the Birmingham Folios, the Birmingham Manuscript. Remember this in 2015? It was all over the internet. When you look at the Birmingham manuscript, it's only two pieces of paper, front and back. It's only 33 verses, and guess what? It's all about the seven sleepers of Ephesus, in chapter 18. That has nothing to do with Islam. It's about the proto-evangelion of James. That has nothing to do with Islam. And it's about the story of Moses. That all predates Islam. All of these are in Arabic, and they are nothing to do with Islam. So what's going on? Hold on. I want to introduce this guy here, Dr. Dan Brubaker. He was in our conference this last weekend. You should have come. This man has just shut the Quran down because of this book right here. You need to buy this book. Basically, what he has done is he's taken the Muslims at their word, and he says, if there's no changes in the last 1,400 years, let's see if I can find changes. And he's, looked, he's the only one that's looked at all the manuscripts, and he has found insertions. There you can see some there. He has found erasures. There you can see erasures there. He has found erasures overwritten. You can see them there in the red. He has found overwriting without erasures. He has found selective coverings. There are so many coverings in the middle one there. There are eight different coverings. What every case when you see insertions, when you have overwriting, when you have any one of these references, these differences, what happens in every case? It brings it down to a standardization of the Huff's text means that this is censorship that's been going on for, for not 1,400 years. It's been going on since the 1300s. For 700 years, they've been changing these manuscripts to make them so they all are alike. Selective coverings, overwritten, and tapings. 
We went down to Speaker's Corner. I go down there whenever I'm in London. There's Hatuntosh, the five foot two lady that destroyed the Quran. They're on my left there. And we decided to introduce this book there at Speaker's Corner. While we were there, one of the leading scholars on the right there, Mansur Ahmad from Bangladesh, got up there and tried to shut us down. And he was making the claim that you can trace the Quran back all the way to the seventh century. So I turned to him and I say, okay, you can do that. Show me what manuscript you're talking about. It's not the Topkapi or the Samarkand. It's not the Petropolitanus. You can't use the Husseini and don't use the Ma'il manuscripts and certainly don't use the Sana manuscript because all of these are 8th, 9th, and 10th century, which is the manuscript that goes back to the 7th century. He finally had to admit that there were 63, there was six, um, 96% of the Quran that they could find within the first century. That means between 622 and 721 or 719. Notice the 63 that he's talking about. These are the fragments that he has found. Notice we looked at every one of these fragments None of them. Those ones I'm putting up there, there's, no one has come to any conclusion on those 20. The next nine are all after 6, uh, 7, uh, 19. So they shouldn't have used those uh, nine. And the next 34, no one's done any work in. Which means he has basically, what the Muslims have done, they've just created manuscripts or fragments. Most of these are just one or two verses. They've tried to come up with 63, to come up with 96% of the Quran, and they're all, none of them can be used from the first century of Islam. Ooh, I love it. It makes my job so easy. <laughs> Thus, none of them are really valid, since all of them are either later or tentatively dated or have no supporting evidence. So, where did the Quran that we have in our hand, where did it come from? This book right here. It was chosen in 1924 by one scholar named Muhammad al Husseini al Haddad. Why? Because they were having such problem amongst the, unit, the high school kids there in the city of Cairo. They were having 30 different answers for all the questions. They went to Muhammad al Husseini al Haddad and said, Choose one. And he chose this one. What did they do with the other 29? Threw them into the Nile, like I said earlier, thinking that would get rid of them. They didn't count on Hatun Tosh, five foot two lady, <laughs> to decide to find them in 2013. Nonetheless, that was so successful of choosing one Quran that by 1936, it was then chosen as the Quran for the entire country of Egypt. By 1985, the Saudi Arabian government saw how successful that model was, so they chose it for the whole world in 1985. How many people are older or living in 1985? Just raise your hands. That means every one of you who's raising your hands is now older than the Quran. Oh boy, that must make you feel old. <laughs> but now we're coming to the best. This is the last thing. And this is lovely. See, you'd like to know where the Quran really comes from, right? I'd like to know where the Quran really comes from. Because if you're having to put together a book because a man have, has been chosen who writes the book, you don't have anything at hand. What are you going to do? You're going to borrow, are you not? So this is exactly what happened in the 8th, in the 9th, in the 10th century. But what did they borrow? Let me introduce this man here, Dr. Gunther Luling, who was a German scholar. He did his doctorate in 1970, and he looked at the Quran. He noticed that there was some beautiful poetry in the Quran. He said, I've seen that before. So he took those five dots off, and he took the three vowels out, and replaced them with Syriac and Nabataean dots, or Syriac, Nabataean Syriac, or Syriac documents, put the Syriac dots back in, and put the vowels back in. And guess what he found? that these beautiful poetry were Christian hymns <laughs> written by Christians about Jesus Christ. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. This was found in 1970. As a result of that, he was such an embarrassment for the academia there in Germany that he, though he received in his doctoral the Eximum Opus, which is the highest grade you could get in Germany, which means that you should be given a professorship in any university of your choice, he was thrown out of academia and he went into obscurity for 30 years. Lived on welfare with his wife. I met him in 19, nine, 1998. I saw, I said, could I see your doctorate? I took it back to England and I got it from Germany. German and put it into English. Now remember, when he writes, one sentence is 400 words long. That's how the academics do it in Germany. We had to bring it down so people could manage it. We got it written in English. It could not, it would not, they would not publish it there in Germany, so that he had to get it published in India. But because of that, there you can see it right there, the challenge to Islam for Reformation. Don't read that. You should need read the, the straw, small print. He then was able, then was resurrected because it was all over the English-speaking world and he died a happy man in 2014. Now, Dr. Christoph Luxemburg decided to go one step further. He's also a German, but that's not his real name, because he will be killed for what he has found. He decided to do what Gunther Luling did, but he decided to look at the dark passages. 25% of the Quran no one understands. 
Not even the scholars understand it. A quarter of the Quran, even the scholars don't understand. Did you know that? Can you understand the whole Bible? Certainly you can. When Jack Hibb gets up here, does he open the Bible? Please say yes. yes. Does he read it? Please say yes. yes. Does he unpack it for you? Yes. And does he apply it to your lives? Yes. Why? Because you can understand every word of it. Yes. And you can understand it in English, right? Yes. Thank God for our Bible. But see, you can't do that with the Quran. You can't do that with the Quran. You can't understand these 25. So what are you going to do? Well, he decided to do what Gunther Luling did, and he took and went to every one of those passages, and he went through seven layers. I won't go and pack each one of them. He went through seven layers, taking off the vowels, taking off the dots, looking at the lexicons, looking and seeing if he could find any Arabic words. He couldn't find any there. So he went to Syriac, put the dots back in, put the vowels in, and he went to the lexicons in Syriac, and guess what he could find? He could reproduce all the 25%. All the dark passages he was able to reproduce. But what did he find? Once he took the Arab Quran and put it to its Aramaic roots, all the dark passages were Christian lectionaries, Christian homilies, and Christian hymns. Every lectionary homily hymn was about Jesus Christ. It had nothing to do with what they found, but who they found. Folks, there are four textual evolutions. I'm not going to go with them today, but can you see what we're doing? I want to ask the same question of the Quran and come to the same conclusion. Remember I said at the very beginning, the Muslims have four things that they demand of the Quran. It must be eternal. It must be sent down. It must be complete and unchanged. I think we shut that down tonight, have we not? And we would not say the same thing about our word of God, the Bible. But hold on a minute. Is the Bible the only word of God we have? Don't we have someone who's also called the word of God, the Logos? Jesus Christ? Let's apply those four to him. Is Jesus Christ eternal? Yes. Number one. Was Jesus Christ sent down? Yes. Number two. Is Jesus complete? Yes. Number three. Is Jesus unchanged? Yes. Absolutely. Everything the Muslims need, we've got. Ultimately, the strongest, most serious problem of the Quran is that it affirms the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians as authentic and true revelation from God, while radically denying central aspects of their messages. Example, the core themes of sacrifice and atonement of the Torah, the crucifixion of Jesus and the deity of Jesus, and even the mere messianic title, Son of God for Jesus, the very nature of God, the fall and the sinfulness of man, necessities and means of salvation. ETC. For this reason, Muslims had to invent the unwarranted theory of corruption of the earlier scriptures, even against the clear testimony of the Quran itself. Galatians 1 6 says, If an angel is to present to you a different gospel than that which we have preached to you, let that angel be accursed of God. Interestingly, we see Muhammad's beginning in the cave of Hira as an encounter with an angel who gave him a different gospel which they refer to as the Quran recitation and if you are to study the happenings after that encounter you come to realize it is something the Bible refers to or categorizes as purely demonic this would be a perfect time if you've not taken time to study the Gospels to do so so you could reach out to more people and then bring them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light until my next video peace out